at a time when change is constant and we are pulled in far too many directions, we need a way to stay present to life and to increase our ability to remain calm, think clearly, and maintain our well being. Many studies indicate mindfulness improves our mental, emotional, and physical health. On a mindful moment with Teresa McKee, you can learn how to practice mindfulness and enjoy its many benefits. Tune in for guided meditations and to hear tips and advice from some of the most respected experts in the fields of mental health and mindfulness. The world truly can be a better place. It all starts with a mindful moment. Hello, hello, I'm Nurse Mo, and this is the Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach concepts and share tips on how to thrive in nursing school and at the bedside. Today, we're kind of following up to a closely-ish tied topic from the previous episode, which was about cellulitis. Today, we are talking about osteomyelitis. Now, before we hop into that topic, let's take a quick, quick, and I mean quick minute for a listener shout out. This one is very short, but it is very sweet. And this one comes from Allison, who says this about Med Surge Solution. Allison says, Med Surge Solution is my lifeline when I'm studying for exams. 10 out of 10 recommend. Thank you, Allison, for sharing your highly rated opinion of Med Surge Solution. And for those who have not heard me talk about this before, it is my video-based program where I teach Med Surge topics. I believe there's over 60 common Med Surge topics in that program, and it comes with downloadable study guides. So it's really tailored to different types of learning, whether you're kind of video and audio-based or you like to read or a little bit of both. So I'll put a link in the episode notes to that so that you can check it out. Of course, you can always just go to my website, straightanursingstudent.com and click on courses in the top menu bar. Alrighty, so osteomyelitis. Last week we talked about cellulitis and the reason I wanted to talk about these kind of close to each other is because there are some factors about osteomyelitis that are similar with cellulitis and you might be asked to differentiate between the two on something like an exam. So osteomyelitis, well, before we get into osteomyelitis, if you want to review cellulitis again, that episode was last week. It is episode 362. So osteomyelitis is an infection that occurs when a pathogen invades the bone. This can be secondary to something like surgery. It could be maybe the patient had a bone fracture and an infection was able to get in there. Maybe a bloodstream infection, you have an infection somewhere else, gets in the bloodstream, now it's traveling and getting in the bone. Or guess what? As a result of untreated or poorly treated or advanced cellulitis, cellulitis can lead to osteomyelitis. But unlike cellulitis, which is solely bacterial in origin, Osteomyelitis can be caused by fungi as well as bacteria. Now, the most common pathogen responsible for osteomyelitis is Staphylococcus aureus and the prevalence of MRSA, which is that methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now, that's on the rise. Other pathogens include mycobacterium tuberculosis. So in a lot of cases, this can spread from the lungs and get into the spine. So that could be a pathogen responsible for osteomyelitis. It could be from E. coli bacteria. It could be from salmonella. And there are quite a few others. I just wanted to give you an idea of the range. Now, osteomyelitis can be acute or chronic, though acute osteomyelitis is more common. So what about risk factors for osteomyelitis? So I mentioned cellulitis already. Having osteomyelitis in the past can put the patient at risk for a recurrent episode. Having a prosthetic joint would put someone at risk. So does smoking or renal failure, patients on hemodialysis, patients with endocarditis, 
anyone having an orthopedic surgery, patients with diabetes or vascular insufficiency, which often comes with diabetes, chronic pressure ulcers, which also often come with diabetes, and anyone with a bone fracture. Now, what about the complications of this condition? Osteomyelitis complications include things like osteonecrosis. So what is that? Think about that word. Osteo means bone. Necrosis means death. So we have death of bone. And when the bone dies, this often leads to amputations in some cases. It can also cause slow bone growth in children. And in children, Osteomyelitis is more common in the long bone, so if it occurs, now they're going to have slowed bone growth. It can cause bone deformity. It can cause septic arthritis, abscesses, and full-blown sepsis. So that's a little bit of an overview of osteomyelitis. Now we'll jump into the straight-A nursing latte method to really dive into focusing on the key things we need to know. So we start with the letter L, which is look. How does the patient look when they have osteomyelitis? What are the signs and symptoms? So in osteomyelitis, and this is why it can sometimes look like cellulitis, is that skin that's overlying that affected bone can be red, warm, and swollen, which if you listen to the episode from last week, also signs and symptoms of cellulitis. But in other cases, the skin overlying the bone may be completely normal. One difference with cellulitis is that the patient will most likely complain of pain or tenderness in that area that is generally, in most cases, a more severe, more significant pain than what the patient would have with cellulitis. Though cellulitis, of course, can be painful and uncomfortable. Other signs and symptoms of osteomyelitis include Difficulty moving those nearby joints, difficulty or inability to bear weight on that affected area. Let's say you have osteomyelitis in your lower leg, very difficult to be bearing weight on that leg, very painful, fever and chills, and malaise. Fever, chills, and malaise are common with any type of infection, right? Now, if that infection is near, let's say, a surgical incision or a wound such as a pressure ulcer, the patient could have purulent drainage because they have an infection going on. In patients who have osteomyelitis of the vertebrae, and yes, osteomyelitis can occur in the vertebrae, then back pain is a very common symptom. So those are the general signs and symptoms. We're looking at bone pain, inability to bear weight, maybe some difficulty moving the joints. The skin could be red, warm, and swollen. And then we just have those general signs of infection, right? We have fever, chills, malaise. Along with that, you know, with infection, there could be elevated heart rate as well. And if the patient does, you know, progress onto sepsis, then you could have that patient with the hypotension as well. All right, so the next letter in the latte method is an A. And what does that stand for? That stands for assess. Assessment is the most important thing that a nurse can do. So you always want to know what you're assessing for. When you have a patient with osteomyelitis, you definitely want to monitor their vital signs, any patient with any infectious process. Vital signs are really important. The patient with acute osteomyelitis will usually have a fever, as I mentioned a moment ago, and may also have an elevated heart rate, that tachycardia. Tachycardia and fever often go hand in hand. And again, as I mentioned, if sepsis occurs, then we could also have hypotension, And that occurs as part of that overwhelming immune response to that infection. So we're going to keep a close eye on vital signs. With sepsis, respiratory rate is also elevated. SpO2 can be low. All kinds of vital sign abnormalities with sepsis. But in general, just with basic osteomyelitis, probably going to have some tachycardia and a fever. We are also assessing pain because osteomyelitis is painful. The bone pain associated with osteomyelitis is, again, generally going to be more painful 
than with cellulitis. And in a lot of cases, it's described as a dull pain. And just because a pain is dull doesn't mean it's not severe. It's just the quality of the pain is a dull pain. You also want to assess the skin over the affected area for warmth, tenderness, erythema, and edema, which can all occur with osteomyelitis. And then another important thing is to assess for safety concerns, especially in regards to weight bearing. Osteomyelitis, let's say of a lower extremity, can put the patient at high risk for falls. You want to 100% teach them that they should not be putting weight on that affected limb and assess their ability to use assistive devices correctly as they are needed. Now, the next letter in the latte method is a T, and that is for tests. It's always important to know what tests are utilized to evaluate a patient with disease conditions because you're obviously you're not ordering the tests as a nurse, you're not ordering the test. It is the MD's job to do that. But when you know what tests are utilized, then guess what? You know what to go looking for in the patient's chart to gather pertinent information. It's also helpful to know what tests are utilized in case you need to prepare them for a specific type of diagnostic evaluation, like a CT scan, for example, or an MRI. So tests utilized for a patient with osteomyelitis include a white blood cell count. Often, a patient with osteomyelitis is going to have leukocytosis, which is an elevated white blood cell count. Other labs that could be elevated are the CRP, or C-reactive protein, and the ESR, or the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So why are these elevated? These are two tests. They're inflammatory markers, basically. So when the patient has inflammation, these values go up. So likely to be elevated in something like osteomyelitis. Blood cultures may be, may be conducted if we're looking at trying to identify the pathogen that's in the bloodstream. And then imaging studies, very, very important for osteomyelitis evaluation. X-ray and MRI are very commonly used as part of the workup for a patient with this condition. And of the two, an MRI is going to be more specific and more sensitive to osteomyelitis and can detect that condition a lot more quickly than an x-ray can. So an MRI could show it within three to five days of the infection occurring, but an infection would have to be brewing for a while, about two weeks, before it gets picked up on an x-ray. Now, remember, MRI, you can't go into an MRI if you have any metal in your body because basically MRI is a giant magnet, right? So what if you have a patient with some kind of surgical hardware in their body, maybe from some kind of fracture that's been repaired. That patient cannot get an MRI. So patients with metal hardware in their body may undergo nuclear imaging instead. You may see this referred to as bone scintigraphy or simply a bone scan. And then a CT scan may be used, especially if someone you know has that metal, can't undergo an MRI, and it's also helpful in people with vertebral osteomyelitis, but for the most part, x-ray or MRI. And then a bone biopsy. Biopsies are really helpful in identifying the specific pathogen so that antibiotic therapy can be highly targeted. So let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about how osteomyelitis is treated and key patient or caregiver education. I am so excited that fall is finally coming around. I am all about those cozy evenings at home. And you know what makes a night in even better? A yummy bottle of wine. And that's why I'm such a fan of First Leaf. Because I'm a member, I always have a great bottle on hand. First Leaf is a personalized wine club that evaluates my preferences and hand selects wines just for me. And I'm telling you, they hit it out of the park each and every time. 
Now as the weather starts to cool off, I go for heavier white wines like Chardonnay and reds like Pinot Noir. And I'm telling you, I received a Chardonnay recently that was definitely a winner and substantial enough to enjoy with my husband's signature fall dish, wood-fired pizzas. Now, aside from knowing my wine tastes almost even better than I do, I also love how easy it is to customize my delivery schedule so I never miss a shipment. And if I ever get a bottle I don't absolutely love, which has never happened, by the way, I know it wouldn't be a problem because First Leaf has a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So get cozy and pop open that perfect bottle of wine from First Leaf. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash nursemo to sign up and you'll get your first six hand-picked bottles for just $44.95. That's T-R-Y-F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F dot com slash nurse mo try firstleaf.com slash nurse mo so far we've talked about an overview of osteomyelitis the signs and symptoms key assessments and tests that you might see utilized to evaluate a patient with this condition now you're probably wondering how on earth do we treat these bone infections so treatment for osteomyelitis very often involves a two-pronged approach, surgery and anti-infective therapy. And this is because anti-infectives like antibiotics, for example, aren't going to very, very easily get into the bone. So what has to happen is a surgeon needs to go in and debreed that infected area and remove any diseased tissue and any diseased bone, okay? Now, what if the patient has a prosthetic hip or some kind of prosthesis that has gone bad, they've gotten an infection in the neighboring bone, and now we have osteomyelitis? Well, in most cases, that joint may need to be surgically removed. In some cases, depending on the stability of the joint and the infection itself, there have been cases where patients with osteomyelitis have been able to get just anti-infective therapy, but in many cases, you will see that that hardware needs to be removed or that prosthesis needs to be removed. And then I mentioned anti-infective therapy. And what you will notice with osteomyelitis is that it's a pretty long course of antibiotics or antifungals. Antibiotics is going to be more commonly used because a bacterial infection is going to be more common. We're looking at four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. And in some cases, the patient may then transition to PO antibiotics for a while. So this can vary. But for the most part, what you're looking at is some weeks, several weeks of really intensive anti-infective therapy. Now, other treatments are going to be aimed at things like affecting the pain of osteomyelitis. NSAIDs are really great at reducing the inflammation and the pain. This does not mean that you won't use other modalities. I remember when I was a first semester nursing student, I had a patient with osteomyelitis and I don't know why I remember this so well. I think because I was so surprised at how painful it was. Um, he was complaining of pretty significant pain and I was trying to do all the things like elevate his arm on a pillow, you know, all those things, elevate it, immobilize, rest, et cetera. Still a lot of pain and he had to get IV morphine for the pain because it was significant. So, you know, you start with NSAIDs for that kind of mild to moderate pain, but opioid therapy may be utilized, especially in the inpatient setting. Okay, I mentioned elevating the area. That's another thing that you can do to help reduce pain associated with osteomyelitis. And in some cases, let's say the patient had to go to surgery for that debridement. Now they might have a pretty significant wound. So we might be seeing a vacuum-assisted wound closure device or a wound vac for that patient. And then another key treatment is very, very exquisite wound care. We've got to keep that wound very clean. This wound care can be prolonged. It can be extensive. These wounds may take a while to heal because think back, 
what were some of the risk factors for osteomyelitis? Things like diabetes or peripheral vascular disease. Patients with those underlying conditions have a very difficult time with wound healing. So this wound care is going to be prolonged and extensive. And in a lot of cases, this may be done via home health. And if the patient is able to get up and around, they're going to be coming into that wound clinic multiple times a week. All right, so those are the key things for treatment. We're going to do anti-infective therapy, surgery, and then these supporting therapies. What about education? Really key things to teach the patient, to teach caregivers. One of those is if this is an MRSA situation, they need to understand how to avoid transmission, how to implement contact precautions at the hospital, what that means for them, and also after the patient goes home. And, you know, one of those basic things is don't share personal items with your family member who has MRSA. Of course, you know, hand hygiene, wearing gloves, all of that sort of thing. You also want to educate the patient and family about preventing cellulitis. Remember, cellulitis can progress to osteomyelitis. So your at-risk patient who's at risk for cellulitis needs to know how to prevent it. So I want you to go back and review episode 362 to get a refresher on cellulitis, the risk factors, and key prevention things to know. You also want to teach the patient and caregivers the importance of adhering to that lengthy antibiotic or antifungal therapy and that they must finish the entire course of medication even when they start to feel better. How many times do people say, well, I'm feeling better, so I stopped taking my antibiotics? No, 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 no. We don't want patients doing that because that sets them up for a resistant kind of like superbug infection. You also want to teach the patient, teach the caregivers about the need for that diligent wound care. If they're having to go into the wound care clinic, they need to adhere to that. If they're having home health, they need to adhere to that. In some cases, maybe the family, maybe the caregiver can do the wound dressings. They need to be taught how to do that. You can also teach them to keep the affected limb elevated and supported with pillows and Definitely no weight bearing on that affected limb. So let's say it's in the lower leg or the foot. That patient's going to have to learn how to use an assistive device like crutches, for example. They're not going to be up and around shopping at Costco with their osteomyelitis in their leg. But if they have to get up to go to the bathroom, then yeah, they're going to use crutches or something like that to get from point A to point B so that they're not bearing weight. Again, you want to make sure that the patient knows how to use those assistive devices. They may get physical therapy for that. And another thing the physical therapist may teach them that you can help reinforce is that isometric exercises can help maintain joint function and help maintain muscle strength while they're not using that affected extremity. So there you have it. That is your osteomyelitis overview. I hope that you found this helpful and that now you feel like, okay, I'm going to go into clinical and I'm going to have a patient with osteomyelitis and I'm going to know the key things that I need to watch out for and things that we're going to do for this patient, the labs and the diagnostic tests I'm going to go look for in the chart and education-wise and all of that. So this latte framework is really, really helpful. If it's new to you, I hope you can see that maybe already. I know many of you listen to these episodes and have been listening for a long time and you're already familiar with that latte framework. I do have a free latte method template that you can download and it kind of guides you on how to utilize this method to focus in on the key things a nurse needs to know. And you can just go to the website, go to straightanursingstudent.com. If you click on the link at the top in the menu bar that says everything, that takes you to a page with basically everything and just scroll down to the freebies section and you can grab that latte method template right there for free. All right, I am so happy to have spent some time with you today and I very much look forward to seeing you back here next week. Bye for now. 
This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing, a proud member of the Airwave Media Network. For more educational podcasts, check out airwavemedia.com. And for more nursing-related content, go to straightanursingstudent.com. Have you ever wondered what the science says about certain foods, products, or treatments? Does chiropractic actually work? Should I only buy organic foods? Are GMOs actually harmful? Is adrenal fatigue real? We've got you covered. The goal of the Unbiased Science Podcast is to dispel misinformation and misconceptions across an array of science and public health topics. We love to debunk myths and help arm our listeners with information so they can make evidence-based decisions. Make sure to tune in to the Unbiased Science Podcast to get all of your questions answered.